Are we ready? Well, I hope so. I would like to call Monday, April 11, 2022, Common Council meeting to order. Clerk Jones, I believe you would like to make some comments regarding the link for this meeting and other expectations. Good evening, members of the public. For audio quality, we will be muting everyone not speaking by default to maintain good audio quality for council members as well as yourselves in the virtual audience. If you would like to speak during the meeting on specific agenda items, please submit your request to speak in the chat and directions to do so are also in the chat. We ask that you provide your full name and address as those are required for all speakers at in-person meetings. If you would like to be called on during the meeting to provide public input again, please insert your name and address in the chat and you will be called on during the relevant time for public input. You will be given five minutes to speak during public input. For citizens that wish to speak during the privilege of the floor, please insert, again, the following into the chat, your, your name and your address, and the council president will call on you and you will be given three minutes to speak during privilege of the floor. Please be sure to unmute yourself prior to giving your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Any disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech and or actions, as well as verbal attacks on any person may result in the individual without notice for fitting the remainder of his or her allotted time. At this time, we would like to welcome Pastor Gilbert Washington of St. Paul Bethel Missionary Baptist Church for the invocation. Welcome. Thank you so very much. I am proud and privileged to be here with all of you. Let us pray. We thank you, our God. We thank you for being our guide. We thank you for this assembly, for this meeting. We thank you for guiding our feet and guarding our hearts. Oh Lord, we thank you for the privilege of our liberties, allowing us to serve, to serve your people, to lift them, to love them, to embrace them, to protect them, to provide a better quality of life for all who live here in the city of South Bend, Indiana. Be with the council tonight. Allow that they may serve you by serving your people. Allow, O oh God, that we may always give you honor and glory. Allow that we may serve with distinction and with integrity, for we too are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We ask, we pray, and we believe in and through thy name, and in thy name do we pray, amen. Amen, thank you so very much. At this time, we will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk Jones, would you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Davis? Henry here. Council Member Lee? Present. Council Member Warner? Present. Council Member Wax? Present. Council Member White? Present. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Present. Council Member Hammond. Present. Vice President Muskowski. Present. President McBride. Present. Nine present. Thank you. There are no uh, subcommittee minutes today. At this time, we will have a special res resolution recognizing April 2022, commemorating March, uh, uh, commemorating as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, we have sponsor. Lori Hammond, and also Henry Davis. Thank you, President McBride. Um, this special resolution um, is a collaborative effort by a number of people. 
Um, as April has been designated as Child Abuse Prevention Month, this re resolution, despite its title, goes beyond the simple recognition of Child Abuse Prevention Month as more agencies and organizations express their support for the resolution, more and more information was gathered about child abuse. And with this, the unanimous opinion of all agencies and organizations is that it requires community-wide collaboration, the explicit recognition that ACEs are common and their long-term impact is felt by entire communities and the understanding that individual organizations will require governmental support in order to fully protect children from child abuse. The list of the agencies and organizations supporting this resolution is lengthy, but I would still like to read it. Um, Adoptions of Indiana, Annum Cara Counseling, Beacon Resource Center, Bowen Center, Geminis Early Learning Connections, Amani, Unidad, sorry, Mentoring Moments, LLC, Oaklawn, Patricia Reynolds from South Bend Community School Corp, Prevent Child Abuse, Abuse St. Joe County, Purdue Extension, Robinson Community Learning Center, SCAN, Shaw Center for Children and Families, the St. Joseph County Cares Consortium Members and Friends, St. Joe County Public Library, St. Joe Regional Medical Center, Lactation Com Consultants, St. Margaret's House, Take 10, the Casey Center, the Early Childhood Services Programs of Beacon Health S Systems, St. Joe County WIC Program, PNCC, Perinatal Care Coordinating Programs, The Babe Store, North Central Indiana Sickle Cell Programs, United Health Services, United Way of St. Joe County, Youth Services Bureau of St. Joe County, and the YWCA of North Central Indiana. It's a pretty impressive list of support. And with that, um, I would like to read through the resolution. <clears throat> so whereas in federal fiscal year 2020, 3.9 million reports nationwide and an estimated 216,000 reports in Indiana were made to Child Protective Services. And whereas child abuse and neglect are serious problems affecting every segment of our community and finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. And whereas effective child abuse prevention activities succeed because of the partnership created between child welfare professionals, education, health, community, and faith-based organizations, businesses, law enforcement agencies, and families. And whereas our children are our most valuable resource and will shape the future of the city of South Bend, St. Joseph County, and the state of Indiana. And whereas the harms that stem from child abuse and neglect are one small portion of the harms that arise from adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, which are childhood experiences that can have long-term impacts on physical, mental, and behavioral health. And whereas approximately 66% of St. Joseph County adults have at least one adverse childhood experience. And whereas the incidence and impact of ACEs are mediated by protective factors, which come from the lived environment and safe, stable, nurturing relationships. And where a strengthening protective factors to protect child abuse, to prevent child abuse, and ACEs requires a focused community-wide effort to strengthen economic supports to families, promote healthy social norms, ensure a strong start for children, teach social skills to children and parents, connect youth to caring adults and activities, and intervene to lessen the immediate and long-term harms of ACEs. And whereas systems of ACEs 
uh, prevention required community-wide community collaboration, the explicit recognition that ACEs are common and their long-term impact is felt by entire communities, and the understanding that individual organizations will require governmental support in order to fully protect children from ACEs. And whereas reduction in child abuse is a direct result of in reduction in child abuse is a direct result of improved parental skills. Parents learn from in-home visiting programs how to manage their anger, how to discipline their children effectively and without violence, and how to ask to for help and support when they need it. And whereas the Youth Service Bureau's Young Man Mom Sufficiency Program is one such unique program serving the young at risk, low income, mothers of South Bend, <coughs> excuse me, in St. Joseph County. And whereas a multitude of organizations with child advocacy programming admirably uh, serve the South Bend and St. Joseph County, and whereas the FSSA 211 system serves as a valuable resource for families and service providers within South Bend and St. Joseph areas, St. Joseph County areas, whereas we acknowledge that we must work together as a community to increase awareness about child abuse and contribute to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and families in a safe, stable, and nurturing environment. And whereas prevention remains the best defense for our children and families. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, as follows. Section 1, the Common Council of the City of South Bend recognizes and proclaims April, tw April tw 2022 <clears throat> Excuse me. As National Child Abuse Prevention Month, Section 2, the Common Council also recognizes and appreciates the efforts of all of the community service agencies who dictate their lives, dedicate their lives to the task of improving the quality of life for all children and families. Section 3, the Common Council urges all residents to similarly dedicate themselves to the future of this community. Section 4, this resolution shall become effective upon the date of passage. Thank you so much for the presentation by the sponsors. At this time, I would yield and ask the council, are there any comments? I would just like to thank the sponsors for bringing forth this um, special res uh, resolution in honor of Child Abuse and Prevention Month. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Lee. I would uh, just like to say that uh, thank you to the sponsors for bringing this bill, uh, this, this resolution before us. Abuse is, is very prevalent in our community and any way that we can acknowledge it and help to s serve those individuals who are part of it um, is what we should do. So um, again, Awareness helps to bring about the change that needs to happen, and and uh, so many, so many of our young people are s suffering from the various forms of abuse, and uh, it's a very important issue that needs to be addressed in St. Joe County and South Bend. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Just going to uh, thank the sponsors for putting this together and bringing this to everybody's attention, and to um, keep the focus on addressing this important issue. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Davis, you had additional comments? It's been closed in the system. I can wait. Councilor Warren. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to th thank the sponsors and thank the service organizations uh, uh, that were listed, the YSB, uh, uh, the YWCA, the Casey Center. Those are all organizations that are critical in our community and near and dear to my heart. And uh, thank them for all the work they do. Um, it, it is very vital and crucial and uh, you, you have uh, our support. And I know YSB has uh, Over the Edge coming uh, in October, and uh, I, I'm gonna sign up, and I'm gonna try to see how many council people I can get here to go uh, mm -hmm. Over the Edge uh, mm -hmm. uh, to raise money for- Sign uh, me up. For Youth Service Bureau. Sign me up. Bungee jumping? <laughs> no, you're, you repel. They also have, um, if I may, um, interject, there is a roof set that is coming up in um, June. Yes. 
and that is to raise money for child abuse prevention. The Casey Center has their chair auction that will be coming up in May. So these organizations um, are reaching out to the community, asking for support, asking for some financial assistance. And um, I would ask that anyone that is able to partake in those. Thank you. Councillor Davis? Sure. You know, I, um, as I was reading that, my mind was, you know, um, working really fast, um, not even the language, but one name comes to my memory when we get to talk about child abuse, and, and I pass by the house on a regular basis, and I can't get it out of my head. 2000, was it 2011, Tremel Sturgis, I don't know if anyone remembers that. It was that young uh, boy, I think he went to Madison Elementary School, his dad um, killed him beat him to death. And so there was, was there signs that showed there was something wrong going over there? Absolutely. Um, were they able to get over there quick enough to, to prevent what ultimately happened to that young boy? No. Um, I think that there were some laws and some things that really prevented that from happening in a timely fashion. But I just wanted to bring his name up. Because that one, that hurt. That one hurt. I didn't know him. Um, he was, his, they, they lived in the district, they were actually right across the street from uh, Miss Adeline's Barbershop uh, on, on West Washington Street. And um, she talk, even talked about the young boy coming over there with his family, his, uh, his, his brothers and sisters, and how they would come over there and buy candy because she sells candy out of her barbershop. And just talking about how um, they were dressed, you know, the level of treatment that they were or were not getting. Um, you know, everybody, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? So, you know, you can't fault anybody for not really understanding what's going on. But I think the signs were there for him. And, you know, uh, his dad just... Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, bringing that Could you to reach our memory. out to the public also in case I have... After my comments, thank I you. definitely will. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you for bringing that to our memory and uh, remembering his life. And it, I know it's dear to all of us and, and very honored to support. Um, Victoria, do you see anyone in the audience uh, wishing to speak in favor of this resolution? Or is there anyone here in our uh, audience who would like to speak in favor of the resolution? Please come to the podium and state your name and address. Good evening, Christina McGovern. Um, my address is 53132 Bracken Fern Drive, South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'm with the Youth Service Bureau of St. Joseph County and also the St. Joseph County uh, Chapter of Child Abuse Prevention. So uh, thank you to Lori and to Councilman Davis for this resolution. And I think um, all of you really have stated already that shining a light on child abuse and talking about it is one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, all of us, rep elected officials, everyday citizens, everyone. So if we are all part of this and working together and trying to do what we can to support families in our community so that nothing, um, no child suffers any kind of abuse. So we can all play a role and we can all work together and we really appreciate this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. If there is no one from the virtual public that's expressing interest to speak on this. Thank you so much. By acclamation, I would ask all council um, for a um, motion for passage. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? <coughs> motion carries. At this time, we will have uh, an update and a report from the city offices. Uh, we have Jordan Gathers, Deputy Chief of Staff. If you please come up and for your presentation, thank you for being here. And if you could state your name and address for the record. Thank you, President McBride. Jordan Gathers, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff with offices on the 14th floor um, of this building. Um, I shared, I did, yeah, I did share a presentation with you guys in regards to the update, so I um, wanted to make sure and have that up so we can all follow together here.
Thank you so much. Awesome, <coughs> awesome, thank you. Um, so today I'm here before you to present an update um, on homelessness here. Um, we, we know a lot of work has gone into um, addressing our most vulnerable population. Um, and so, but I appreciate everyone's um, input and suggestions on, on how to do, to how to do things better. Um, quite, quite a few meetings have taken place. Um, so I'd be remiss not to thank everyone who's been a part of those conversations um, and, and, and work, working towards solutions together. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so here, here we have a point in time a homeless count um, and C list, which stands for coordinated entry. Um, and the coordinated entry is a tool that is used to assess and prioritize individuals for housing and services. Um, it also helps communities um, it prioritize assistance based on vulnerability um, and severity of services and needs. So um, this, is, this is basically to ensure that people who need assistance can receive it in a timely manner. Um, and their guiding principles refers to basically access, um, assessment, prioritizing, and referral. So when we look at the state of Indiana here, we have, we have different regions um, across our state. Um, and in 2019 and 20, we saw the totals of 413 and 516 um, homeless um, individuals that, that were accounted for. Um, and so as, as you continue to look at the, the, fir the, the next few bullet points here, you'll see that in that count, that last year we we dropped significantly, um, and so I will I will make an important note to that number and that that drop in the sense of that there was there was a few errors within the state's report um, compounded by the pandemic, um, and so we will say that 2020 is probably that 516 number is probably more of a uh, accurate number, um, if you will, um, but happy to see that we are seeing a, a trend going down um, as, as far as last year and currently we sit at 233 on the coordinated entry list. Um, next slide, please. So the last time um, I, I, I was before, you, uh, before the council, um, I gave an update kind of on the mayor's implementation group, um, which convened in August of 2020 um, until the end of that year. Um, in which we put together a, um, a, a strong, robust, powerful network of peers um, that worked, as you can see, we had some elected officials, we had a few council members um, here as well um, on, those, on those 8 a.m. morning calls, um, going into identifying and implementing, um, or identifying and implementing strategies for both short-term and longer-term strategies as it relates to our unhoused population. Um, and also building a city that provides support and opportunity for all who call South Bend home. Um, and within this, within this implementation group, um, we felt that it was best to break it into subcommittees, which you'll see here um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, we had health and sanitation, um, we had weather amnesty, and then we also had preventive supportive housing. Um, these three subcommittees were crucial and critical um, as we continue to be a little bit more focused um, and, um, and more specific um, in the interest of the group. We had about 20 to, 30, 20 to 40, I would say, it would vary um, each meeting um, of individuals within the implementation group. Um, but the, the subcommittee groups were much shorter, probably around 10, 10 to 15 for each uh, subcommittee. Um, next slide, please. So we, Within, within the culmination of the, the subcommittees and the, the mayor's implementation group, um, we, we came together to address homelessness and to, um, to recognize the situation. This situation has been years in the making, 
Um, we've also, we, also, we also understood and quickly came to realize that um, it cannot be solved overnight. Um, and so he, we had a few of the um, subcommittees come up with recommendations for, um, for the mayor, for, for our community, for the city, um, on how we would like to move forward um, in addressing our, um, our, our unsheltered um, individuals and neighbors. So the first, sub, the first subcommittee here, Health and Sanitation, um, as you can see, um, we, had, we had some uh, laundry services as well as um, some porta johns or porta potties, if you will, um, downtown, Century Downtown um, located. And um, the, um, to my knowledge, and, and I believe that uh, this was run um, with partnership in Burden's la Laundry, that this is still taking place um, on Wednesdays. Um, we've also developed a, a, a partnership with Transpo to provide free and affordable transportation. Um, and then also um, being able to utilize some of our willing service providers without our city. Um, next slide, please. As it relates to the weather amnesty and housing um, uh, subcommittee, um, we continue operations with weather amnesty, um, which um, a lot of the members were very adamant about. Um, and so we, we continued that. We extended the, the support of the Motels for Now program, um, and, and as well as um, utilizing, um, utilizing buildings to house individuals, um, you know, and making sure that we were very intentional about understanding that most of these things are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the needs are, are significant, but we understand that um, smart planning and execution um, will continue to um, emerge some of our, our responses here um, after, even during the pandemic and after. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the last subcommittee, we had permanent supportive housing, um, which the, the members came to expand um, some of the city's uh, permanent supportive housing developments. Um, they've also recommended to develop a housing trust fund um, to create a homeless coordinator position um, and then also um, support and education and advocacy campaign. Um, next slide, please. So within, what I, when I just mentioned that we wanted to create a, um, a homeless, you know, a, uh, a homeless coordinator position, we were able to do so, um, and, and, and we were able to do so last year. Um, this happened, this happened, we wanted to hire one person but we ended up hiring two, um, two individuals, Ann Mannix and Betsy Benito, um, who have been, who've done a really good job in putting together these recommendations and putting them into motion. Um, and so here are some of the, 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 here are some of the deliverables that we were able to, um, that we were able to come up with as it relates to their contract. Um, these are not city employees, um, but they, but the, it was a, a 12 year contract um, that, that we, that we were able to, uh, to commission, and, and here are some of the here are some of the uh, the deliverables here as far as collaborating with various groups um, for that educational campaign to make sure that we're dispelling some of the stereotypes and reimagining the narrative as as it relates to our homeless population. Um, you know, improving upon the coordinated entry process, which that tool is very complicated. But at the end of the day, we've we've had we've had a great run at trying to uh, make, make it more efficient and effective. Um, and then as well as uh, research for funding opportunities related to operations um, and a development of a pro um, prospective initiatives um, such as a low barrier shelter um, and the exploration of that. And then also drafting, um, more importantly, drafting a multi-year services plan to address some of these existing um, and planned services that, are, that our homeless individuals are experiencing. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give um, everyone here on council, um, in 2020, I, I wanted to bring this back to the table as far as um, noting our CDBG and ESG CV funding. Um, as you can see, the total there, um, we wanted to make note that this does not include any of the reimbursed costs for COVID, um, of uh, COVID-19, quarantine motel, and other, and other um, expenditures. Um, but wanted to really make note of some of the items that were, were expended in, in, in that year. Um, next slide, please. 
Here we have a funding breakdown of the 2021 homeless implementation budget. Um, that 650 number, um, we want it to, we, we, that, that these, these things are happening um, and have and are in progress and have happened. Um, and so wanted to, to note um, weather amnesty, um, permanent supportive housing leasing, as well as um, low barrier shelter scope planning and, and preliminary design. Um, as well as the uh, homeless facilitators, the transpo bus passes, which for um, which which we have the the dates there as well, um, and also still in denoting the uh, countywide coordinator match as well that that that's still in that that pot for the implementation budget. Next slide, please. So, um, so now we, we get to 2022, um, and, and we, we're sti we still have a line item um, for, for these series of, of uh, initiatives, um, if you will, and recommendations, um, and, and making, making note that, that, um, that most urban cores are contending with the um, increasing number of unho unhoused individuals, but um, this 650,000 total um, within implementation has been um, you know, has been assigned, um, and just wanted to again note that um, that these are these are very important, um, very important recommendations that we're moving forward on. Next slide, please. Um, so here, this slide is highlighting some of the supportive projects that we're working on. We were very intentional with the mayor's implementation group and and county coordination and being and working at this together. Um, making sure that we're not um, working in silos, if you will, um, and so wanted to outline some of the projects that um, that have been in the works that are pending, um, and that we're continuing to have um, conversations on. So we have the expiration of a low barrier shelter; um, those talks are still being had, but there has been conversations and potentially um, having a such site at uh, Portage Manor. Um, Next, you have the Behavioral Crisis Center. Um, this, is, this is a project of a 23-hour assessment observation center, um, which would fall under the Memorial Hospital um, license and would be subject to all hospitals accreditation um, recommendations and regulations. Um, a, an advisory board was put together by Dr. Uh, Robert Einhertz, um, which I sit on the board, and, and, and also uh, President McBride as well. Um, and we're hoping to have more detailed plans come forth um, in the coming weeks as far as um, the next steps for that project. Um, next, we have uh, y YSB, um, which we're continuing to, to look, at, uh, pro uh, look at funding for that project and, and, and outline the, detail, the details um, on that plan, and then as well as Center for the Homeless. Um, the county has awarded them a million dollars for their renovation of their space. Um, and, and, um, but it's contingent on a match, and so um, there has been a request from the city um, to match that, that million dollars for their, for, their, uh, for their renovations, for their space, um, and so we, we will continue to have conversations with them in order to, to, to accommodate that, that request. Um, I just wanted to make note here at the bottom that, uh, that the city budget includes 5.8 million of American Rescue Plan supported funds for county partnerships to address uh, homelessness and mental health, um, which was mentioned in the Behavioral Crisis Center. Um, so next steps, um, we're, you know, we are gonna con continue to work with permanent supportive housing. Um, we're very excited about the, the opening of Hope Avenue Homes, um, which would be dedicated to tw uh, 22 units um, for individuals, which um, which is hoping to, to open here in the spring of this year, um, we we also were uh, we're also were a part of the Indiana Institute um, for Center for Supportive Housing um, and Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, um, which we were a proud we were, we were sick. It was six teams across the state that were able to participate in a series of trainings um, and 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 being able to. Uh, to be around other other entities and, and other cities um, and seeing how they address supportive housing for their populations. Um, and so that application process is still pending, but we've applied for the tax credit portion of that and waiting to, waiting to hear back. Um, 
and currently we're in the 2022 uh, Institute, which um, I was just, me and a few other team members um, were just a part of in Bloomington um, in another session and hoping to, to compete for funding for another project um, similar um, or, or more, a little bit more innovative than, than the one at Hope. So we're, we're hoping to do more of a scatter site, um, a scatter site units as, as you can see here and, and, and hoping to kind of work towards that and, and have more updates here um, in the coming, in, in, in the middle of this year. Um, we're continuing MOTOS for Now partnership um, as, 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 uh, as, as stated before and then also the low barrier shelter with the county. We wanna continue that um, and, and continue conversations to move that forward, um, as well as finalizing the community educational campaign, which, uh, which is really gonna be important that we've contracted with J2 Marketing um, in that aspect to, to put together um, a campaign that, that includes websites, that includes uh, billboards, uh, vid videos, um, just a, a, a way to be able to to show the community um, truly what homelessness is, um, and and how to be and how to show our, our help and support uh, moving forward, um, and and lastly, um, we're we're looking to reconvene our implementation group um, to assist our city facilitators in their deliverables um, and making sure once their reports are complete um, that everyone everyone has an, an opportunity to convey their, their suggestions and thoughts and, and continuing to get better um, in this effort. Um, so with that, you know, I will, I will say that, um, that you know, this is a complex issue um, and we're, we're ha we've been having frequent conversations with partners um, and internally to move impactful solutions um, forward. And so I encourage you all to, to continue to, uh, to join us on this journey to navigate to navigate these uncertain times and to continue to build a city that provides support for, for all who call South Bend home. So uh, that concludes my, my presentation and happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your presentation and all of that information. At this time, I would ask the council, uh, you get two questions at this time a piece. And if there's any additional, uh, please send your questions directly to Mr. Ga uh, Gathers or to myself to make sure that we get it answered. I'll start down from the left. Uh, Councilor White, do you have any questions? No, just thank Mr. Gathers for the presentation and the summaries. I think it was very helpful to, do, to look back on those uh, other um, years in regards to from a financial perspective, but also looking towards the future and what it's gonna take for our city to ensure that everyone has adequate shelter and that we're serving those most vulnerable within our community. So thank you for the, your report. I look forward to receiving the slides. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilor Tomas Morgan. I have no questions. I just wanna thank you, Mr. Gathers, for your report and as well wanted to ask if you will be sharing the slides with us so, so that we could share with the public. Absolutely, will do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Denise Gatsby. Thank you, Madam um, President. Um, the only question, and thank you for the presentation. It was a very informative presentation. On the Epworth that facility, the 23-hour facility, mm -hmm. um, do you envision, so like when a, if a police officer runs across an individual that needs help, is that primarily what that facility would be used for? And I seen you didn't have a dollar a amount on there, but is that the primary use for that facility? Yeah, so the, oh, sorry. So yeah, so the Epworth, that, that would be, um, we, we definitely, it, from, from the advisory board conversations, there has been talks about what the center will be filling, the, the gaps that will be filled, um, and, and a lot, um, and one was that they would be, um, from, from individuals that gets calls or 911 dispatch, that they would be able to, to utilize that, that new facility. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, thank you again for the presentation and update. You're welcome. Councilor Warner. Thank you. Councilor Lee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gathers, for this information and uh, seeing how we are moving the ball forward. Uh, I was on a lot of those eight and morning calls and uh, the group of individuals that he had to galvanize and, and work with, uh, you did a great job of, of getting people 
broken out into groups and, and getting results. My one question is uh, the, the low barrier center that they're thinking about, Portage Manor, can, can you give us any more information on, on that? So I, I don't have any more information on that, uh, Councilman Lee. But uh, but knowing that it's still in the uh, it's still in conversation on which site no site has been determined. But I know that uh, that there has been conversations around the Porter the Portage Manor site being one that could be viable um, for for future discussions. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Wang. Thank you. Um, I'm thank you for your presentation. Uh, lots of helpful, valuable information. Um, I was pleased to see that the, at least based on the PIC numbers, um, the overall local homeless population has decreased 50% over the past few years, 20, 25% over the past year. Um, it, what's your level of confidence in that number that it's a true reflection of the, a reduction in homelessness versus um, perhaps more, less effective tracking. So I, w I will say, you know, like there, there were a few, as noted, there, the, the state report was, um, there were some errors. So um, as far as confidence in the, the, the numbers, we have to go by what's accounted for. Um, and, and I will say that there, are, there is a population of unseen homelessness or, 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 or homelessness or homeless individuals who aren't accounted for. Um, so that, that number could very well fluctuate um, in which we, we saw the fluctuation and um, over the years since 2019 and up until now. And so, um, you know, I hopefully, I, you know, I, I will say I hopefully that those numbers continue to trend down and, um, and when the next report comes out, we don't see a, a spike. <laughs> but anecdotally, you, you spend a lot of work in this, a lot of time and effort in this. Anecdotally, are you seeing a, a reduction? Like, do you feel that that number makes, like it sits right with you? That with these numbers, I will I will say that the 2020 number seems more viable um, as far as the, the the higher number, um, and I and I will say I, I think we should probably err on that side as opposed to you know um, hoping that it goes away because it's not going to go away. So I, I will say that from from our research and from what we're seeing that a lot of the initiatives and a lot of the uh, projects that we have going that that number is decreasing, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. And to that end, I guess that leads me to my next question. I'll ask you the same question that I asked you last year. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, focus and I think wonderful work in assisting those that are homeless and mm -hmm. a lot of attention being put into um, potential housing solutions, um, either with partners or provided by the city. Mm -hmm. um, what other than providing housing or making that connection to actual housing, what efforts is the city doing to uh, actually reduce homelessness rather than just assisting? So I will say that the city, we do not provide direct service to the homeless, but also, um, but we'll say that we will do everything that we can to continue to provide a social, uh, a social net network for, for our vulnerable population. Um, so as, as you can, as uh, noted on, on the presentation, we have a very, uh, we had, we had, we, we took on those recommendations um, from the community, from from the from the uh, members of the home, the mayor's implementation group, um, and and I think it, it encompasses the work that we've all put together to address this uh, this very complex issue. Um, so I will say that um, that a lot of the deliverables and, and actions that that uh, that we have in the works um, address um, address the reduction and prevention of homelessness in the years to come. Great, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Gathers. Um, as everyone knows, I spend a great deal of my time working in this wheelhouse of um, providing for homeless. Um, we have now had, I think at last count, three um, studies done as to what are the best approaches for South Bend to address the homelessness. And in each of those studies, it has identified a full-time permanent homeless coordinator position. And when Ann Mannix was hired, she was actually doing research, not coordinating services. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering 
why we are hesitating to fill a full-time permanent position as has been the recommendation now in three different homelessness studies done in South Bend. The first two done under Mayor Pete. So um, that's a great question, Councilman uh, Hammond. I will say that um, we have to, we have to, we, we felt that the contract position was a, was a great start and to be able to coordinate a lot of these efforts for, um, and, 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 I, and I think noted in the budget, we had the countywide, um, countywide coordinator match um, to ha I, I believe there was conversations um, with the county and and um, but those those conversations are not off the table. I will say um, again that I, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, homelessness will not be solved overnight. So I um, I am happy to have those th continue to have those conversations to push for a full time position um, so that um, so that we're all on the same page. Thank you. And secondly, around the weather amnesty. Um, I appreciate everything that the city does around cold temperatures, but there are um, an equal number of conditions and threats around heat. And I think not having a 12 month weather amnesty is not really addressing all of the concerns that are affecting this community. And it would be something that I would strongly recommend that um, the city sit down and have a serious conversation about. Um, my next question, um, when will we get to see the report that Ann Mannix filed? So Ann Mannix and, and Betsy Benito, um, they're working in tandem um, and it's still being under review now. Um, and, but um, as mentioned, we're, we're, going to be, we're going to be reconvening the mayor's implementation group and I'll be sure to, to send you an invite to, to present their results and report. I would like to read the report. Can I get a copy of that? You meet at eight in the morning and I teach school, so that's not really gonna happen. Absolutely, we'll, we'll be sure to be committed to transparency and sharing that report with you. And, Thank and, you. And other members, yep. Councilor Davis. Sure, I just have a comment. And um, Jordan, I like you as a person, as an individual. I appreciate the work that you do, you have done. I don't want you to take my comments personal because they're not aimed at you. But I'm not sure how this is gonna work when we are preparing for people that we can't even count because they just move around, right? And so there's like this presentation that you just made that suggests and supports the city is working at it. Well, more than two years ago, myself and my colleague to my left um, drafted, authored a resolution because Monroe Park, which is in the second district, was taken over by folks who were homeless and just kind of like just staying over in that area. Um, we not only have that, but we also have the transient population that comes in and out from the center from the homeless, which is in the second district as well. Then we talk about whole rescue mission, which is in the second district as well. And so when, I, when I'm listening to all of these things that are supposed to be happening, I'm not encouraged that anything is going to happen. And the reason why is because we tried to have this conversation several years ago. And now we're still looking at the future and not anything on paper. Uh, that's suggesting that there is an, ex an exact goal or there's an exact date for these things to take off. I, I find the timing of it very suspect. Um, I, um, I'm gonna say it, next year we file for re-election if we desire to run for office again. And so I have, I'm gonna be very critical of this because we try to help. We try to offer our support and somehow some other people were chosen to participate on these boards. Great, I haven't heard anything since. This is the first time. Again, not you, not you, sir. But the overall issue itself seems like somebody's trying to win the issue. We're trying to solve the issue. There are people out there that need our support and, and guess what? And some of those people don't want our support. They're happy doing what they're doing. I've met some of those guys too. So I, it, it just, it, 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 it defies logical nature for something that's 
as, as critical as homelessness is, and, and as sensitive as it is, because we're probably all one, one check away from it, um, that we will play uh, with the idea or politicize the idea to where we're still trying to figure out the next step. When we tried to have this conversation three years ago, we tried to have this conversation probably like 10 years ago, and, and, and probably about 50 years ago. It just continues to go on and on. Um, I hope it works. I hope it works, but I, I, I really find all of this to be very suspect at this point. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your presentation, and I am honored to have been uh, appointed to serve since 2016 on the Homelessness Task Force under uh, former Mayor Pete. So I uh, commend the report and continue to look forward for us to work together on the um, low barrier, the crisis center um, that I was just appointed to by um, the health department and also uh, continue to do this work. So I am uh, hopeful that we'll continue to have a path forward through this very complex issue. So thank you to all of my colleagues for your comments. And if there's any further questions, again, you can direct them to Mr. Gathers or to myself for us to get some answers for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will have the Commuters Trust team uh, come on up. Denise. Please state your name and address. Good evening. Uh, my name is Denise Lynn Riedel. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for the City of South Bend with offices on the 12th floor of this building. Um, I'm going to let uh, Lynn Wetzel here uh, set up. Lynn is the Executive Director of Commuters Trust. And so um, I'm going to pass over the, the uh, limelight to her shortly. And she's going to give you, uh, the council members, just an overview of the, the program. Uh, actually, this program. Um, really started in 2018 when um, several folks in innovation technology and the mayor's office started to engage with residents about uh, barriers to employment in the city of South Bend. Um, and we really heard the theme over and over again uh, during that time, that was even before I started at the city, um, that uh, transportation insecurity was, was a big barrier to not only getting but keeping a job for hourly wage workers. Um, and so uh, I just kind of wanted to ground this, prog this program that Lynn is going to provide an overview on in that problem uh, and, and back in that time in 2018. Um, that same year, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies posted an opportunity called the Mayor's Challenge. And it was a competition between cities to win $1 million to solve a systemic problem um, that was potentially had transferable solutions that other cities could learn from. Um, the thing about South Bend is we're a mid-sized city and our transportation challenges are very real. There are lots of other cities that experience challenges like ours. It doesn't look like Chicago. Uh, it doesn't look like a uh, rural area either. Um, we have a bus system here. Uh, we have public transit. We have lots of assets, but um, we don't have the density that a big city has. So we have some really unique um, challenges that we realized made us a great test bed for innovation in South Bend. Um, and so that's really the, the history of this. Um, uh, Lynn's going to provide an overview of the program for you. Uh, I know many of you have uh, been involved to some degree uh, during the Commuters Trust project, um, but it's been a while since we've had a formal update to Council. And so uh, we wanted to just give you an overview of the entire program. Um, it's been, I think, 10,000 free or uh, discounted rides since we, we last talked to you. A uh, pandemic has happened. Uh, a board was created, a whole governance system. Um, three, uh, three staff uh, have uh, been recruited, a small but lean team. Um, and 20 plus partners probably have been involved in this project. And so um, uh, Lynn's going to provide an overview. And uh, any questions we can't answer today, we'd be happy to provide in writing to you uh, after the presentation, too. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Lynn Wetzel, and she's going to give you an overview of Commuters Trust. Uh, hello, all. Uh, 
my name is Lynn Wetzel uh, from the Technology Research Center uh, on 1165 uh, Franklin Street. Can you all hear me? Sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am the director of Commuters Trust. Um, I work with Jamison Edwards, um, who is our project manager, and Raphael Ademi, who is also our In Focus fellow. Next slide. Um, so as you all know, uh, transportation is a common obstacle. Um, it is keeping, that's keeping uh, a job and accessing critical services. And so this is why uh, we, com we created uh, Commuters Trust. This is why it's formed. Um, so uh, today we are going to do a quick overview. Um, we're gonna review the program origins, uh, the partners, uh, benefit offerings. Uh, we're going to review uh, program's impact on the community, and then we'll take some any questions that you may have. So, um, as Denise mentioned, uh, the city of South Bend participated in the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge. Um, it's a year-long competition um, that challenges cities uh, to uncover um, and test innovative solutions to confront some of the toughest problems faced by cities today. Uh, the city of South Bend um, engaged with residents uh, to understand uh, the barriers of employment, and there were two barriers that came up um, that over and over again, and that was affordable, accessible ch uh, child care and reliable transportation. Uh, so there was a decision that was made uh, to focus on transportation. Uh, so the city of South Bend crafted an application uh, for uh, the Bloomberg's Mayor's Challenge and won the $1 million grant uh, to test innovative programs to help hourly wage workers in our city. Um, so, and the city of South Bend um, was one of nine uh, of the winning ideas. The Commuters Trust Program was one of the nine um, winning ideas of the 2018 uh, U.S. Mayor's Challenge. Um, so here, uh, the slide you'll see here, this is uh, some of the early days of the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge. Uh, you'll see some familiar faces up there, uh, Mayor Pete, Denise, uh, Aaron Steiner, who is our former, uh, or our founding director, uh, and Jack Jacobs also as well, who is the former project manager uh, with InFocus. Uh, next slide. So uh, our solution to transportation insecurity. Um, we operate, our program operates and works directly with transportation vendors um, and program partners uh, to test transportation as, ben uh, as a benefit packages. Uh, we um, have, as Denise mentioned, um, we've partnered with several um, organizations and empl employers um, in the region. Um, and in 2021, 20, uh, we actually hit a, a milestone, um, 10,000. Um, rides, 10,000 10, miles, okay, here we go, trying it again, 10,000 uh, K rides, I shouldn't read the PowerPoint, should I? Um, and that's 6,000 uh, free rides, uh, free bus rides, and 4,000 uh, free or discounted Lyft or Uber rides uh, for members of our community. Uh, next slide. So here is just a timeline uh, here. Um, so you'll see in 2018, we test the ideas of the program uh, with two local employers, and then we were able to receive the uh, $1 million grant in 2018. And then in 2019, um, we launched our phase one, um, phase one of our ride guarantee program. Um, that's the program that provides the free and discounted rides. Um, we launched that in September of 2019, and we offer discounted lift rides and uh, Transpo uh, bus passes as well. Uh, and then in 2020, in March of 2020, we actually uh, launched our, um, we actually launched um, phase two of our program. Um, so in addition to, in addition to providing uh, lift discounts um, and digital bus passes, uh, we also provided uh, carpool reimbursement options um, as well. And we had two new employer partners um, that uh, joined the Ride Guarantee Phase uh, 2 uh, program um, in 2021. So uh, 
as you noticed, the uh, timing wasn't uh, the best um, in 2020, but in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we realized that there was a need to help more residents suffer, suffering from transportation insecurity in our community. Um, Commuters Trust, um, we were able to, uh, with our ride guarantee program, um, we decided to test um, Uber benefits with our workforce development agency partners um, with Work One and Goodwill uh, to provide rides to clients. Um, because if you think about it, you have um, individuals um, who need rides to and from work, but then you also have individuals who are uh, training, who don't have a job, who are trying to get a job, and they also need assist assistance as well. Um, and so, um, and then also from there, we kind of use the workforce development program. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, in 2021, um, uh, we actually launched our uh, community nonprofit partner program, CMPP. Um, so that provides fully subsidized rides um, to over 150 individuals um, through partnership with um, 13 different community organizations. Uh, so I, again, we are uh, providing as many rides as we possibly can, um, you know, fully subsidized rides to people who need access to critical services. Um, and then, uh, and also in 2021, we offered these uh, no-cost trials uh, to different employers. So if they wanted to test out our program um, to kind of see if this is something that would work for them, they could uh, test out the, the program uh, for an eight-week period. And, we, and that was a uh, no-cost trial. Um, and through those trials, uh, we were actually able to pick up uh, six additional employer partners. Um, then we also, um, in 2021, at the end of 2021, we started piloting uh, gas card programs, uh, a gas card program. And this is a, a debit card um, that is, uh, has a merge code restriction that allows individuals to pay for only gas or for car repairs. Um, because again, we understand that there are individuals who um, may have a vehicle, um, but you know, they're struggling, <coughs> struggling to pay for gas or they're struggling with car repairs um, and it would be extremely difficult for them to go and uh, purchase, a, purchase a new car, um, purchase a new or used car, especially at this time uh, with car prices being, you know, what they are. Um, and so that also just leads to the next point. Uh, we also uh, hosted a uh, launch event with On the Road Lending in 2021. Um, that's a CDFI uh, providing affordable loans um, for qualified individuals. Um, so we hosted events um, at the end of 2021 because again, we wanted to make sure that everyone has reliable transportation. Um, and there are just so many different, you know, needs in the community, whether that's, you know, a bus pass, whether that's a discounted Lyft or Uber ride, um, or just help help with a loan for a car or help with repairs. Next slide. Uh, so just quickly, just a program overview. Um, so our goals for um, our three you know, programs that we have, and really this is just, it's all one program, but there are three buckets. So it started off with our employer sponsor program, right? And the goal of that is really to just kind of make it easy. Um, we have an automated enrollment process for um, for this for this program um, through our text-based uh, web app system. Um, and we work with CodeWorks to help develop uh, that system. Uh, and that was um, launched at the end of 2021. And also we wanna increase productivity, uh, decrease absences and stress. Um, so we want to track an individual's participation and usage and their feedback to accurately report costs and impact. Then the goal of our workforce development program uh, to boost new hires, uh, trainee numbers um, for partnered workforce uh, development agencies for those individuals who are able to pay for transportation on their, um, for those who are not able to pay for transportation on their own. And then um, finally the goal for the community nonprofit program really to increase self-sufficiency. Uh, self um, by easing access to critical services for um, our most vulnerable population. And this here you'll just see, um, these are just a few pictures of um, a ride guarantee enrollment. 
Uh, I must admit, it's been a while since we've taken pictures. These were taken actually before I actually joined the team um, in 2019, um, as you see here. Um, but there are a lot of on-site visits um, that the team did to recruit um, you know, different individuals to join our Ride Guarantee program. Next slide. And then here you will see, um, so you'll see here a list of our employer and workforce development partners as well as our community nonprofit uh, partners. Um, one thing to note here, uh, Catholic Charities, uh, United Religious Communities, as well as La Casa, uh, we're working with them and they are um, actually helping um, Afghan families as they resettle into the community, so we're assisting them. Um, and we, again, recently added Catholic Charities and United uh, Religious Communities uh, to our list of um, organizations that we're partnering with. They were uh, originally part of uh, the one-year pilot that we started. Next slide. And here you'll just see a few pictures of our program offerings, um, just the transpo um, bus, and then we also have a participant here uh, who's taking a lift ride. Okay, and here we go, our, our big milestone here, and this was uh, posted on um, Bloomberg's Twitter page. You can see here. So the employer-sponsored uh, programs impact. Um, so Commuters Trust, um, so we actually partnered with um, Notre Dame and the Pulte Institute uh, to, to study program in impacts. Um, and then here are just some high-level insights uh, you'll see here, um, so during the first four months of the program um, in 2019, um, employers saw kind of a, a decrease in absences, um, but then when we got into 2020, um, here you'll see that there are some mixed results. And I mean, and really, you know, a lot of that is that the pandemic, um, but there were, you know, COVID had like really big impact on essential workers that we, uh, and you'll just see that there is um, an 85% decrease in volume to safety, um, furloughs, illness, et cetera. Uh, that's what you'll see here. And so um, because of that, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So um, as I mentioned, so it was essentially just with the uh, reporting, we were getting mixed results. And you think about absenteeism and um, you think about tardiness, there are other things that affect that. Uh, so. Um, you know, we're talking about homelessness, you talk about food insecurity, you talk about childcare. Um, so we moved towards uh, self-reporting. Uh, so there are research, re researchers at uh, the University of um, Michigan um, that they developed what is called uh, the Transportation Security Index. Um, it was developed by Alex uh, Murphy, Dr. Alex Murphy, and Dr. Alex, Alex Goldworth um, at the University of Michigan. And so participant TSI measures um, are collected um, upon enrollment um, in the program and um, every 60 days uh, thereafter. Um, so our, and so for a TSI score, if you have a low TSI score, then you would be considered transportation, in, uh, transportation secure. Um, so CMPP participants, uh, those uh, individuals who are providing full subsidies for um, they have higher TSI scores on average um, than some of the individuals in our employer-sponsored um, program. Um, so, and, and we actually distribute this TSI, these TSI questions every 30 days to our, our CMPP participants as well. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide here, and so this is, again, this kind of shows you based on the questions you add up the, um, you add up the, the um, answers um, that they're provided, provided uh, to get a TSI score. And so this graph is actually of our CMPP participants. And so you'll see that there is a, a drop, there is a, um, there's an, a sharp uh, drop in, in score, and then it increased again. Um, something that should be noted here, this, I guess the time point for um, these surveys were taken during the holiday and also 
you know, you'll see here from the baseline, there are 128 participants that were actually, uh, that actually took the survey compared to just 28 um, participants at time point four. So that's something to kind of be mindful of, um, that these, these results um, do vary. But at the beginning of the program, we saw um, that there is definitely a meaningful like, impact um, um, on um, participants once they start to, once they started with the program. So here are just a few um, stories of impact. Um, and I've you know, changed the names um, of these individuals that are participating in our program. Um, but you see here that Jessica, she credits the program with significantly improving her quality of life. Um, you know, and you know, even she recently tested positive for COVID, but she stated that the program saved her at least a couple hundred dollars, I guess, since November. And that's what we're, you know, these are stories that we're hearing is that you'll have individuals that are, are saving hundreds of dollars just by joining our program. Um, and, you, you know, that's, it, it's, you know, improving their quality of life um, and just also just providing them with reliable transportation, which is really our goal, providing reliable transportation for all residents in the region. Um, and then Jonathan, um, unemployed in South Bend, um, he's actually another uh, CMPP participant. Um, he didn't have a reliable way to get to his doctor's appointments. And so, you know, again, you have a lot of residents um, in the area they need access to critical services. They need to go to their medical appointment. They need to uh, pick up their prescription. Um, you know, and and in some ways, you know, the bus works for a lot of um, individuals. But you know, so we provide that option of, hey, uh, if you need a bus pass, here's a bus pass. But if you need to get to your doctor's appointment, um, if you need to pick up your prescription, you can also use this other option, um, which is a fully subsidized uh, Uber or Lyft ride. And that's all. I just want to thank everyone. Um, and we're just opening up for any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. I will start with the right. Councillor Davis, you have any questions? No, I thank you for your presentation. Councillor Hammond. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. I appreciate it. Um, in your presentation, it mentions 6,000 free bus rides. But in our previous presentation, the city has budgeted 30,000 for the last two years for free bus passes. And I'm wondering, is there any communication between these two entities that are supplying free bus transportation? Yeah, um, I'm happy to look into that and see. Um, but I, I, this is a separate, uh, a separate program currently. And so, um, but I'm happy to look into that, uh, Councilor Hammond, and um, answer your question. Uh, do, do you recall like what presentation that was in? Mr. Gathers? Oh, with the, the, hom the homeless program specifically? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, um, from what I can tell, that's a different collection of additional free, free bus rides. But um, I can coordinate with uh, Jordan just to double check on that for you. But it's a different, a different project. Okay, I think it would be important to make sure that these are not going to similar pockets of individuals and I, I love the program, but I just think, you know, some oversight on that would be um, a good idea. Secondly, um, uh, MACOG and Transport are conducting the Connect study, and I'm just wondering if any of um, the um, results that you are finding are being communicated to those conducting this study, because I think it will be helpful in trying to orchestrate new routes and figure out that unbelievable question between coverage and density or whatever that thing is they're trying to get us to decide. Um, so you will be communicating? We, we, yeah, we already have. We've already attended several meetings already, so yes. And um, uh, both Transpo and, and MACOG are on uh, the Commuters Trust Board. Perfect. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor Wax. No questions. Thank you for the presentation. I definitely learned a lot today. Thank you. Councilor thank you. Lee. Uh, thank you, Lynn and, and Denise, yeah. for your presentation. I know Lynn, you're a little nervous, but you did good. <laughs> um, 
seeing it from the, the perspective of individuals who were transportation insecure and since this program has come aboard, it has made a tremendous impact in the lives of people who need it to benefit from a program like this. So um, w we see it from the side of, 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 uh, of goodwill and, and how it's impacted the individuals uh, that, that are participating in the program. I think it, it, there's some, it's, it's gonna be ending soon, is that correct? or uh, are there plans for expansion? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to take that first and then uh, give it to you. Uh, yeah, so, um, and one of the reasons why we're providing this update to council is at the end of this year, um, Commuters Trust is gonna be transitioning from what I would call um, the piloting uh, philanthropic phase to the operational phase. Um, so you saw the long list of partners that, that Lynn posted on her slides. We're starting to engage with, with all of those partners now and, and understand what that operational phase looks like. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, at the end of this year, uh, the grant will transition into sort of steady operational state to figure out how we can sustain these types of um, innovative activities in our ecosystem around transportation problem solving, but then also sustain some of the programs that we've seen work really well. Um, uh, in South Bend uh, through this project. And uh, again, this, this has been a brilliant program, ran in a, in a great way, and the impact has been very significant, and, 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 and we see it and we, we hear it, and we're very, um, very optimistic of, of, of what's to come, because uh, it really is, it, it, it's been great. The bus passes, the Ubers, the, the lifts, it has helped people solve a, a big problem. And so once we get, a, get the problem solved, now we can move on to sustainability. And so thank you for your presentation and the work that you've been doing. I know it's been hard work, but it's been worth it. Thank you, and I'll interject. That's what um, I was gonna ask about after the money is dissolved, um, how are we gonna sustain the project and continue on with the services that people need for the, this vulnerable population? So thank you for that. Councilor Warner. Thank you, and I agree with the earlier in your presentation, you talked about the two greatest impediments to finding a job, a child care and transportation. I talked to a lot of our employers that can't find people and I asked them about how they assist with two of those and they go, I don't know, what can the city do? Um, so I'm, I'm interested, can you kind of briefly talk to me about transportation on a benefit, as a benefit and kind of what that looks like and how successful has that been? I, I don't want to take a real long time, but uh, in just a minute or a minute and a half, and, and, and is that something that more broadly we can take out to a larger segment of employers in the community, and how do we do that? I mean, I mean ab ab absolutely. I mean, we, I, 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 again, we, um, we're able to recruit, I guess, a number of our employers, and I, I should mention too, we split the cost um, with em our employers. So it's a 50-50 cost here, and then the, em the employee um, actually pays a, a copay um, for the ride, so it's either three or five dollars, and I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, but we were able to recruit, recruit a lot of employers, especially towards uh, the second half of, of, of 2021, um, by offering uh, those eight-week no-cost trials uh, to allow employers to kind of test out this program. Um, and we all, uh, between the trials, also we had a number of webinars as well. Um, I think be between those two things, we were able to recruit um, the number of, I guess, employers that we, we have right now. Um, so it, it, it's, it's doable. I mean, and again, it's just, you know, we can just get the word out um, that this is a great pr program. I mean, if anyone is interested in the program, um, and they're an employee, they can email us, and then we can reach out to the empl their employer um, so that we, we can start uh, a trial with them to see if this is something that's worthwhile. But most of, most of the employers that we've worked with that have, we, that have tried the, uh, that have been enrolled in the trial, um, have, we've been able to convert them over um, to full partners, so. Yeah, I think if you went out and you said, you know, I can increase your, or decrease your rate of absenteeism, you know, ha you having uh, provided a portion of a, a Lyft or an Uber, I think that's something that, that would go over fairly well. They just need to, you know, they need to be shown the way to do it. So thank you, I appreciate it. 
Thank you. Councilor Nuskowski. Um, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Councilman Warner kind of took the question that I was gonna, when I heard benefit package <laughs> for, um, I, that really sparked an interest in me as well because if that is a barrier for people that have you know, limitations with transportation, what a wonderful way to, to get them to work, get them up on their feet and, and take that burden off of them and a three to five dollar copay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that rolls out is, um, I guess that'll be next year since this will be ending toward the end of this year. Would that be the measurement for that? Yes. Okay, that's all I have. Thank Councilor you. Councilor Tomas Morgan. Thank you, President McBride. I thank you both for your presentation. When um, Denise and I were uh, brainstorming topics for our IT um, committee, and uh, this topic came up, and we felt it was important enough uh, to have um, presented at council meetings so all council members would be able to hear the update. It has been a while since we've heard about Commuters Trust, so to get this comprehensive overview of the program itself, to be refreshed about it, but also to see um, some of the, uh, the amazing impact that the program has had. I share with others who, uh, others of my colleague um, who share concern about what's next. Um, it's clear this is a impactful program, and so um, want to um, um, want to help think through um, how we continue to support such a program like this in our community um, with the kind of impact that it's making. I, um, the a question I had was, you just for clarification, Denise, you had said that South Bend is one of few cities of our size with a program like this, is that correct? Um, uh, this is really the only city that's okay. doing a program like this. Um, like Lynn said, there, I believe there are nine other Mayor's Challenge, or there are nine total Mayor's Challenge cities in the first generation of Mayor's Challenge cities. There's um, one or two other cities doing transportation related uh, prop, um, prototypes, but nothing like this. And so um, Lynn and her team really are uh, trailblazers in this respect. And so um, part of what you know we promise to do um, with the with Bloomberg is to really be open and communicative about the, the lessons learned uh, with the program. Um, and we get questions a lot from, from other cities and communities uh, our size that have similar assets and challenges. You know, how can we replicate this? And so, Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Glad to know that you're um, sharing the story and uh, helping other cities think through um, implementing such a program. Um, my second question is, as you, um, work with employers um, and the new nonprofit programs, are there, um, are you learning any ongoing obstacles that they have to increasing access within their clientele? I mean, we, uh, you know, so, so, you know, we're working, especially in the CNPP program, we're working with a transient population. Um, so, uh, there are individuals that will, you know, change their phone numbers um, from time to time, and that can be di uh, difficult um, because we do offer uh, digital um, benefits. We also offer a physical 31-day you know, bu bus pass um, because we know that there are individuals that struggle with technology, and that is that is um, easy, you know, for them to use the bus pass. Um, but we would like get more people enrolled in the program so they have access to those uh, uh, fully subsidized Uber rides mm -hmm. uh, that we're providing as well. So if they need to go somewhere and uh, the bus is not running or you know, say it's a Sunday um, or in the evening time, they can use those benefits. Um, even, you know, even though they uh, may not necessarily be uh, super tech savvy. And, you know, we, we try to work through it with them as, you know, as much as we possibly can. Like, we have great um, community you know, partners um, that will really work with us and work with the individuals to help them get enrolled um, so they can have access to all of the benefits that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's really great. And we also have um, a text, an SMS uh, service that we have so individuals can text us if they need help with enrollment. But th that's felt that's... I would say like the biggest problem that we're facing right now. Okay, thank you so much. Councilor White. No, 
Well, I just thank you. I would just like to thank you for your presentation and the data that you've been able to bring forward. And the one question I had has been addressed, and that was the sustainability of the, the program as well as even expanding the program. And you had made mention that transportation and child care <coughs> were the two main barriers. What kind, have you seen that trend to still be true in regards from a, you're providing the transportation, but has child care become an issue as well? And if so, have you had any conversations with the child care providers? So, I mean, we have had um, some conversation with child care providers, um, and we've enrolled a few um, in our uh, no-cost trial, um, but I, we're unable to kind of convert those, that, those trials into um, full-time programs. Uh, just in regards to the access for individuals and their access to, to child care, um, we do get a number of questions like, hey, can I use this Uber ride to drop off my kid and then go to work? Mm -hmm. And uh, Uber, both Uber and Lyft allows you, they will both allow you to add a stop so that, that you can actually go drop off your kid and then go to work. So yeah, that question comes up you know, fairly often. So we are trying to, to solve that problem, at least getting um, your child uh, to child care um, with this, this Uber, Uber and Lyft benefit. Yeah. Okay, thank you, it's nice to know that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, now I entertain a motion to resolve to the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Second. There's been motion and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? The motion's carried. The Committee of the Whole is now in session. This is the portion of the Council's meeting where bills are given a second reading and public hearing. I wish to share with you that bills that will be given a second reading and public hearing have been given a first reading and set for a committee meeting and a public hearing prior to this evening's meeting. In addition, you will hear from the chairperson of the committee where the bill was discussed and the results of their discussion. If the proposed ordinance is a zoning ordinance, a report from a staff member will be given, and in all situations, the formal presentation of the proposed ordinance will, be immediately, will immediately be followed by the committee report. The formal presentation shall be on time. We're now getting ready to hear Bill 11-22. Clerk Jones, will you pl please give Bill 11-22 a second reading? Yes. 1122, public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, approving a petition of the Advisory Board of Zoning Appeals for the property located at 1033 Oak Street, Councilmanic District Number 1 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Is there a committee report? Yes, there is. Um, Bill 1122 came before the Zoning and Annexation Committee this afternoon and comes to the committee the whole with a favorable recommendation. Is the petitioner present? I ask that you state your name and address and share with us key points regarding the bill that is before us. Good evening, Council. Joseph Molnar, Department of Community Investment, offices on the 14th floor of the County City Building. Before you today is a special exception for property located at 1033 Oak Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, just a half block north of City Cemetery. Uh, the petitioner uh, is requesting the special exception to allow for a duplex in a U1 Urban Neighborhood 1 uh, zoned um, parcel. The property was recently acquired by the new owner. Uh, it had been illegally converted into a duplex uh, sometime in the past. Uh, we had known it was done illegally because there was no separation between the two units. Uh, when the petitioner is go uh, went to get pull building permits to renovate the building and update the two units. He found out that it was illegally done, so then he came to our office to seek the special exception. Uh, when we reviewed the petition, though, we did look at it as if it was currently a single family uh, structure as uh, it was illegally done in the past. Uh, this is the house as it sits uh, today, or at least two months ago. Hopefully there's no snow out right now. Uh, when we look at uh, housing decisions, we always try to look at the census tract uh, data for the population, uh, especially the recent trends, just to get a handle on what's been happening. 
uh, track 19, which is essentially uh, from the city cemetery north to Lincoln Way uh, west, uh, has seen severe population decline uh, since 1960, a decline of almost 2,000 residents, which is 60% of its 1960 population, uh, severe uh, you know, household uh, collapse in this area. Uh, however, we, we did uh, hopefully see a, a turnaround during the 2010s. Uh, obviously, when you, when you decline so much, the turnaround uh, it can be a little easier to, to acquire, but we are happy to see it. And this was actually the fastest growing census tract in the city uh, during the 2010s. So there's clearly a, still a desire for individuals to live here. And the petitioners responding to that with uh, uh, renovating their currently vacant home. Uh, this is the floor plan that the uh, petitioner presented, essentially uh, one unit above uh, on the second floor and one unit below on the bottom. Uh, I know most of you uh, heard the presentation earlier, so I'll keep it a little briefer. Um, the Lincoln Park neighborhood actually has a neighborhood plan that was established 10 years ago in 2012, and it states existing multifamily housing located in the neighborhood that utilize originally built single family structures are supported, but opportunities revert uh, opportunities to revert these properties back to single family are also encouraged. Uh, that is what this petitioner, the staff believes, is doing. Uh, they're renovating the currently vacant building, but because they're not changing the exterior, they're not making too dramatic changes to the interior itself, a conversion back to single family would be possible in the future. Therefore, the staff sent it to the Board of Zoning Appeals with a favorable recommendation, and the Board of Zoning Appeals sends it to you with a favorable recommendation as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Council members, do you have any questions? All right. At this time, we'll go to the public hearing portion. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak in favor of Bill 11-22? There is no one from the, the virtual public that is expressing interest to speak in favor of Bill 11-22. Okay, is there anybody here um, in, 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 the, in the chambers that wants to speak in favor of Bill 11-22? If not, uh, is there anyone that wishes to speak in opposition, either here or virtually? There is no one um, wishing to speak in opposition of Bill 1122 as well. All right. At this point, the public hearing on Bill 11-22 is now closed. Um, again, council members, are there any, any statements, comments? No. If not, I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 11-22. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Clerk Jones. Oh, excuse me. Um, there was we need to make a motion. I need to make a motion to, oh, to send it favorably to, to the full council. Mm -hmm. I would like to make a motion to send Bill 11-22 for the full council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Second. <laughs> There's been a motion and a second. Clerk Jones, will you please call the roll? Yes. Council. Councilmember Warner? Aye. Councilmember Wax? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Tomas Morgan? Aye. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Vice President Muskowski? Aye. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. All right. Um, Bill 11 22 will be sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. We will now hear Bill 14-22. Clerk Jones, would you give Bill 14-2 a second reading? Yes. Um, 14-22, public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, <coughs> amending the South Bend Municipal Code at Chapter 2, Article 9, Section 2-129, to change the residency restriction of commission members. Is there a committee report? Yes, the Residential Neighborhoods Committee uh, heard uh, Bill 1422, and we sent it to you with a favorable recommendation to is the, the committee as a whole. Okay. Is the petitioner present? I ask that you state your name and address and share with us key points regarding the bill that's before us. Mr. 
kecil. I'll start off by saying to President Sharon McBride and members of the Common Council, I appreciate the opportunity for allowing me to present this ordinance to them, the South Bend Municipal Residency for the Human Rights Commission. I am Yolanda Young hyphen Smith. I am the Executive Director of the Human Rights Commission, 319 North Niles Avenue, South Bend, Indiana, 46617. And I'll wait for her to pull up the presentation. I did present earlier, so I'll go through it quickly. Hopefully, uh, we can get out of here. <laughs> so thank you. I think um, Ms. Uh, Young Smith will have to test your skills with the backup of uh, attorney Aladine DeRose to give us an uh, update until she can get it. Um, if you wanna give an overview of the ordinance, I think that would be great. Good evening, members of council. I'm Aladine DeRose, city attorney with offices on the 12th floor of this building. Uh, presently, the South Bend Human Rights Commission ordinance requires that all members of the commission be residents of the city of South Bend. That ordinance has that, ha that restriction has proven difficult in the past several years because so many persons have moved uh, from the area who may be interested, who are interested, and who have expressed interest in, in uh, being part of the commission as a whole. Um, we cannot <coughs> appoint, nor you as the appointing bodies and the mayor cannot appoint members who live outside the city limits. Also in the last few years, and this is probably most significant, the human rights ordinance has now been adopted by the county and the county through an interlocal agreement with the city has uh, in, enabled the city to enforce the county's ordinance outside city limits. So we are enforcing the a substantial equivalent of our ordinance within the county. Um, with that expansion, uh, because we are investigating cases outside of the city limits, it makes sense to have certain members, at least some representation on the commission of persons who live outside the city limits. So for those two reasons, the fact that um, we are limiting the talent and the um, opportunity of those living outside of the city from, sit from being a part of the commission's conduct and its activities 
supporting civil rights and, and equal opportunity throughout the area. For that reason and because we've now expanded to enforcement of the ordinance outside the city limits, we're asking, and the Human Rights Commission itself has recommended by its own resolution that you amend Chapter 2, Section, I always get that, 229, uh, Article 9, Section 229, to uh, 129, to um, allow commission members to reside outside of the city of South Bend limits within the county. Can you touch a little bit on the interlocal agreement? I'm sorry? Can you speak a little bit about the interlocal yes. agreement? Yes, thank you. Uh, the interlocal agreement came about uh, about four, three or four years ago when the county itself, I think in, 19, in 2017, adopted an ordinance similar to that of the city um, prohibiting discriminatory practices throughout the county. That ordinance is substantially equivalent to the ordinance that we have in South Bend. So the county has an ordinance and the city have an ordinance substantially similar. The county was, uh, the county had no body or agency that investigated the cases that fell under the jurisdiction of their ordinance. So the purpose of that interlocal agreement was to allow the city human rights commission to investigate the cases that the county might have under its ordinance. Um, and so with that, we've, we've entered into an agreement for the City Human Rights Commission to be the investigative body for the county and its cases within the county. Uh, the county pays us a portion, a, a, a stipend for, that, uh, for the use of our staff time to do this. And that's been in existence since, as I, I believe, since 2018. It has been confirmed by, by this council uh, as recently as 2019, and it continues indefinitely until either body uh, determines that it's no longer useful or work workable. Um, at this point, we don't see that happening. All right. Well, thank you all so much. You, you, you've done it. You, you did a great presentation um, earlier tonight, and and with the technical issues that we're having, um, we're we're going to go. Huh? Oh, it's up there. Yeah, such a professional. She <laughs> you can go through it, and this will be really quick. I think uh, okay. Tony Allegheny covered all, everything. There's one thing that, so she covered that, so we can push the next slide. We're asking you to make this change. You watch, next slide. So she explained why we need to make the change. Thank you, uh, Tony Allegheny. So continue, continue. And I want to speak a little bit here. So we know we have nine commissioners and we have two vacancies. One vacancy, I started with the commission in December 2021 and one of our commissioners reti kind of retired um, and then the other one became a vacant in January. So we've had some really qualified people who could fill these positions, like uh, Attorney Allen said, but they were outside the city limits. So she explained why we think this is important Sometimes it's been up to the point that we didn't have enough to make a quorum just by one, just shy of one. So if we had a full, uh, if our commissioners, <coughs> were, like I said, all nine of our commissioners, then it would make it easier and less stress on me to wonder the day before <laughs> if we're going to have enough people to present our cases. And I don't know what we said earlier, but our interlocutor, interlocutor agreement only covers employment. It doesn't include housing. And if you go on resolution, and she did say uh, the, what our resolution, we would like our resolution to the next slide to read as such. So instead of saying the county, the city, the city of South Bend, we would like to say the county of St. Joseph. Anything else? Yeah, just That's one, all I have. One, one side note, and that is that the member of the commission who resigned um, in December was was a longstanding member of the commission and, and and very and very active and she could no longer serve because she had moved to the county. That's all I have. Thank you for allowing us to present this resolution to you today. And if anybody have any questions, we'll take questions. All right. Are there any council members that have any questions for the petitioners? Yes. 
Mr. Davis. Thank you. Uh, the interlocal agreement, why doesn't that include Mr. Walker? They have a governing body as well, and it just seems like it'll be apropos for them to participate as well. Or even the school corporation, one of the two. I, I'm, not, I'm just asking. Um, we've asked the county, we've asked Mr. Walker to participate, and at this point, they were not ready to commit to that. Um, but the ordinance covers the county, so technically it affects um, Mr. Walker. Oh, absolutely. That's why I asked. Because yeah. it seems it like. Applies. It applies to Mr. Walker because Mr. Walker is within the county. They're just not a part of the interlocal agreement. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea of them being a part of the conversation more than just a recipient. We had this conversation some years ago, and it was it covered the whole argument about their governance and also ours and us doing sort of the most, but they are not offering any assistance. I think we had a bill before this council and I wanna believe that it was the LGBT uh, Q plus bill before us. And they were really uh, unhappy with the fact that there was really no office outside of the city of South Bend and that many of the members that came in here were residents of Mishawaka asking us to change or give them an ordinance for protection. And at that point, we had a discussion about the Human Rights Commission and whether the Human Rights Commission should be expanded and also include Mr. Walker. I'm not stepping on your baby, your idea. I, I really am not. But I do remember that conversation vividly because of the amount of people that came in from outside the city who are not voters of this city. And they got a bill passed for themselves that supported what they wanted to, and they lived outside of this city. So they were out, uh, actually asking the city of South Bend to support what is not happening in Mishawaka. And I just thought that that was like, you know, kind of like, you know, a lot. But I'm going to support it. Thank you. I think Mishawaka does participate in many of this Human Rights Commission's activities, but in terms of being a part of the interlocal agreement. At, that, at this time, they're not. They should be. Thank you. Any other council members? Councilman Hammond? Yes. Um, earlier, Councilwoman Tomas Morgan asked if there would be, um, I'm not sure if the wording was preference given to South Bend prop before going to council or to um, board members from the county. And I'm just wondering, is there specific language that identifies how that takes place, or? I can answer that question. And I think, I, I hope I did for acceptably to Council Member Thomas Morgan. Uh, there are no restrictions. However, what this does is allow the pool of applicants to be expanded. So we can provide to you when you the council make your recommendations for appointment and when the mayor makes his recommendations for appointment, we can provide you with an expanded list of persons who live not just in South Bend, but within the county as well. And from that, you would draw and you would select at your discretion those who you think would be the best fit for the commission. Thank you. Anybody else? Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak in favor of Bill 14-22? There is no one from the public expressing interest to speak in favor of Bill 14-22. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak in opposition of Bill 14-22? There is no one from the public that is that's an interest to speak in opposition of Bill 1422. Okay. At this point, the public hearing on Bill 14-22 is now closed. Uh, council members, are there any statements that you would like to make regarding Bill 14-22? Okay. I will now entertain a motion of <coughs> regarding Bill 14-22. I'd like to move that we send Bill 14-22 to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I'll second. second. All right. There's a motion and, is, and a second. Clark Jones, could you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Muskowski? Aye. 
Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Mm -hmm. Bill 14-22 will be sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I will now entertain a motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole and report back to the full council. So moved. Second. Clerk Jones, can you give us the roll, please? Oh, we can do it by acclamation. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. The full council is now back in session. This portion of the meeting is where bills are given a third reading and action is taken regarding bills that were heard during the committee of the whole. Clerk Jones, would you give bill 1122 a third reading? Yes. 1122, third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, approving a petition of the Advisory Board of Zoning Appeals for the property located at 1033 Oak Street, Councilmanic District Number 1 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you. Councilor Lee, is there a recommendation? Yes. Um, the recommendation is that Bill 11-22 uh, be sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 1122. I would like to make a motion for passage of Bill 11-22. Second. Clerk Jones, will you call the roll? Yes. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Mustafsky? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Bill number 1122 has been adopted. Clerk Jones, would you give Bill 1422 a third reading? Yes. Third reading, 1422, third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the South Bend Municipal Code at Chapter 2, Article 9, Section 2-129, to change the residency restriction of commission members. Thank you. Councilor Lee, is there a recommendation for bill number 1422? Yes, President McBride. Bill 14-22 uh, comes to you from the Committee of Whole with a favorable recommendation. I will now entertain a motion regarding bill 1422. Move for passage. Second. The roll, please. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Mustafsky? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Bill number 14-22 has been adopted. There are no resolutions on today's agenda. Bills on first reading. Clerk Jones, will you please give Bill 1622 a first reading. 1622, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending Chapter 19, Article 1, Division 2, Sections 19-9, 19-18, 19-19, 19-20, of the South Bend Municipal Code to make text changes. Thank you. I would like to move that Bill 1622 go to, um, well, for public reading, second and third reading on April 25th, 2022. There's been a motion, is there a second? I will now entertain a motion uh, that Bill 1622 is sent to Parks and Residential Neighborhoods Committee. For when? With, without a date, it goes to the committee without a I date. I have a question so about that. Mm -mm. I have a question about that. Yes, sir. Why would it not receive a date in a hearing? That's a bill that's been filed um, to support uh, not only the second district, but the entire city. And it's not coming from me, it's coming from my neighborhood associations. One person is here right now. And there has to be a conversation on how do we uh, clean these neighborhoods up with all of these trees and all this shrubbery from thousand houses and thousand days or people who just don't want to uh, clean it up. So by it not getting a date, 
you're telling my district and you're telling the people with my district that they don't deserve uh, their voice being heard on this uh, on this council floor. But that doesn't mean that at it all. It does the mean that. So why doesn't it have a Mr. date? Mr. Davis, because the conversation that I had, and not from you, but from Councilor Hammond. But it's my bill. Me, she called on behalf of you, and the conversation. She can't that, call on behalf of uh, me. She called on behalf of you, and she called me, and we had an extensive conversation. The conversation that I asked, and she said, and uh, Attorney Palmer also said you were present and agreed that this bill would not, it would need extensive conversation. The committee's chair had not been notified at the time, so I am putting it in committee per your request for the joint committee for there to be dialogue and conversation. That does not mean that it not will not be heard. That means that we all need to have an opportunity for the people that it will touch to have a conversation so we can make sure that it is uh, passed and that it would be um, heard by the committee, heard by the administrators who need to be involved in all the stakeholders. So the so conversation that I had on the behalf assuming of you, that, that hasn't happened. I've had that I was, conversation. Uh, I was no. told that it was it did not happen. But she didn't know, and she should have called me. You didn't call me. You had her so call I don't me. have to call you. You had her call and speak on your behalf. No, she said that she was calling you because she was looking for another sponsor. She said that you have already said that you wanted to get something like this done. That's why the phone call was placed. I am now, placing, I'm, I'm, I am placing I'm, the... I'm just being clear about this now. I am placing it so, into the Parks and the Residential Committee so for, when does further, it happen then? for further discussion. It goes immediately to the Parks and the Residential Committee. But when does it happen? It goes immediately the to the Parks. The conversation that you're suggesting. From you, your referral, you get with Councillor White and Councillor Lee per your request Neither one for it to go to, to that me. joint she, committee. Uh, Councillor White responded back to me. She said she'll read it. Councilman Lee did not respond. We're going to move on. It was assigned to the Parks so, and the Residential so second Committee. second district doesn't I get it. I'll, I'll I, there's I, a I motion move. on the floor. Yes. Is there a second? A second. A second. Clerk Jones, could you read the roll, please? Vice President Mistassi? Aye. Council Member Davis? Nay. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Yeah, I would prefer to, you know, if they bring these bills, they don't talk to anybody. I'd prefer to kill them in, com in committee and just let them go and die. I say well, nay. Well, you're assuming that I didn't talk to anybody, and I'm the second of you guys They're saying that. They're in the middle that. of a roll. I, that doesn't matter, but We're you're in not going to put, call you're point not gonna put false we information out there. We have you're to assuming We're that in the I middle of. I, uh, Point of order, I, Mr. I Davis. We're in the, 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 the middle of a roll call. We're in the middle of a roll call. And I talked to the, uh, to, to the, uh, 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 Clerk Jones. Council and Member I talked Wax. to Aaron. We even had a whole meeting. Clerk Jones. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Thomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Seven ayes. Thank you. Um, could you please read bill number 1722? 1722, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending chapter 16, article 8, section 16 through 54, 16 through 57, and 16 through 59 of the South Bend Municipal Code to make text changes. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to send Bill 1722 to Health and Public Safety Committee. So moved. Second. Clerk Jones, the roll, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? No. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Thomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Mustassi? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Eight ayes. Thank you. The motion is carried. Clerk Jones, would you give Bill 1822 a first reading, please? Yes. 1822, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City establishing Juneteenth as a designated city holiday and amending Chapter 2, Article 8, Section 2-120, of the South Bend Municipal Code to appropriately increase the total number of designated holidays for officers and employees of the city. Thank you. 
I will entertain a motion that this be sent to the Personnel and Finance Committee for public hearing and third reading on April 24th. So moved. Second. Clerk Jones? Yes, it's April 25th. April 25th, right. yes, thank okay. you. Um, Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Muskowski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. At this time, are there is there any unfinished business from the council currently? Yes, I have a question. Um, what is the system that's set up for the council members uh, to be informed on what is happening? Um, case in point, just by, based on the last conversation about the bill, Troy say we should kill it. We assume that I haven't talked to a uh, department head. We assume that I haven't talked to uh, the committee chairs. We assume that those things didn't happen. All of those things happened. And then when the council was told that it happened, we still don't want to believe it or we don't believe it. So if folks feel like that they have not been included, what is the system that's in place so they are included? Because I did send emails. Emails went out. Folks got phone calls. There was a phone, um, we had a Zoom meeting that lasted over an hour. So what is the system? Who are you directing that question to? You, you you're the council president. Well, you mentioned Troy's name, so I didn't know if you were talking to me or No, him. I was talking to you. I'm saying that he said kill it before it gets, when it gets here because it hasn't well, had a conversation. Well, I wasn't a part of an email. I was not a part of any Zoom call. What I did get was a phone call from Councilor Hammond. So there was no assumption from the conversation that I had. The conversation that she and I had, I was very, she was clear on the information she relayed to me. And when we move forward, that's the discussion that we had along with her sharing her conversation with Attorney Palmer and I followed up with Attorney Palmer. So there was no dialogue between you and I. The message was passed through uh, Councilor Hammond to me. So there's no, there was no assumption on my part. There was the direct conversation that she had with me telling me about the conversation that you had and I saying got that, that it needed you, to be worked through. So you're, you're missing what so I'm saying. So if, if it's not coming to, and we're working on the chapter two updates as well, but, and, and we've talked about this extensively at the past caucuses. That's one of the what purposes is the of us having the caucus. for other council members to know what is happening with other council members? I got all of that. We well, if you, that. Are, if you would be inclusive to the other council uh, people, inclusive. then we would know what's going on and not just coming on to the uh, information but what's the on the then? bill. What's communicate, the you're, you're, you're saying something. Communicate with the council. So when a person wants to file a bill, we need to communicate with the entire council you that need we're to, filing the bill. At least you need to co communicate with the chair of the committee. I did. And you also need to communicate that information, I would assume, in the hope with the president because she's the one who put the agenda together. You did. So. So the system that you're saying was already followed. No, I'm not. Well, you said, the, okay, so can we get some type of like clarity on how this is supposed to work? I've been on the council since 2008. What, what works is and that I've there's never, a conversation. I've, I've never had a problem with filing a bill and getting a date. This is the first time I've ever had a problem filing well, a bill and getting a date. Well, it's, it's in the uh, statute or that at. we could do that. So I have the authority to do that if, if the chair was not notified. So we can have a bigger, broader conversation. I'm trying to you have and it now. I, you I'm and asking I, you a I'm, question. And I what answer the, the question. If you're not satisfied with the question, that's not my issue. I'm not satisfied with your answer. With your, I asked the question. If you're not satisfied with the answer, then that would be what Councilman you take White, out of it. Seriously, so. this is nuts. You've been on this council for a lot of years, a lot of terms, and you have never seen, I've never seen that happen. Can you please brief us on your experience on how council members were, are briefed mm -hmm. on after something is filed? Councilmember Davis, up with new rules as we that go. discussion is between you and the president. Uh, you the too, president, because you're on the council. So if you file yes. a bill, you're going to be held to the same standard. I hope. Yes. We had I a bill no last year that. that went to committee. No it was uh, it went to my committee because you didn't want to take the bill. It was the utility bait rates bill. I'm it got that. set without a date because we set multiple hearings on it so we could have lots of public. You're discussion. allowed that as a committee chair. Yeah. 
Now, that's not what I'm questioning, sir. I'm questioning the system in place. would you like to clarify, please? He can't, because there's no system. Normally, bills are given a day for a second reading, but that's uh, entirely up to the discretion of the um, uh, chairman of that committee. Uh, apparently, uh, chairman of the committees were not uh, involved in, in these discussions so that um, uh, they are not, as I understand it, they are not being set for a second reading yet until there are further discussions on the bill, both with the community and with the uh, uh, chairman of the committees they're assigned to. We got that. You're still not giving me clarity on a one, two, and three. You're just stating what has happened. We know that. I'm asking for a one, two, and three, four, and five if possible. I don't know. But if a council member files a bill on the date that it's due, then it's up to your discretion as the council president to say Absolutely. yes or no. It's what you just said. Absolutely. And, 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 and that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. But let that be it. Don't say because council member did not communicate with council chairman of each committee, nor did he have a discussion with the director of those uh, different departments. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then there has to be a one, two, and three in order for that to be uh, uh, solidified. Question. And I'm not, did I'm you, not, uh, did you have a, to anybody did up you here. Have a, did you have a conversation with Councilor Wax regarding no, the cold No, I didn't have a conversation bill. with Mr. Wax. That's a point, point taken, that the reason why that code is not with a date. Why would I have a conversation with him? Because this bill number 1722. It was supposed to have gone to, so that's a mistake. It was supposed to have gone to uh, Park and Rec and. That's bill number 1622. Yeah, I know. That's residential and parks. But 1722, a code that's health and public safety. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's why, so that's my question. It Counselor wasn't supposed Wax. to have gone there. That's what I'm saying to you. That's a mistake no, as well. No, that's not a mistake. That's where that code violation goes to health and public safety. Well, how safety. can you tell me it's not a mistake and it's my bill? Code, it still has to be assigned to the correct committee. But Cold it was supposed to have gone to public safety health and committee. public safety just as well as, what was it, Bob? It was another one, um, uh, neighborhoods. That's what the other conversation was supposed to happen with. So that's why Mr. Lee and Mrs. White, Miss White was uh, con connected with or contacted. That was because of the tree ordinance and parks and the conversation with uh, Aaron that Perry. I, I'm just asking for a one, two, and three. That's it. If that's, the, if that, if that's how we're going to be operating, that's, I have no problem with that's that. That's exactly. I, I, when I just asked if you talk to, and like I said, when I have those agendas, the attorney is present, and the code violations falls under health and public safety. It's no trying to pinpoint, call anybody out. That goes under health and public safety. That's fine. Counselor I just, Wax I'm, I'm, was I'm, not notified. That's so fine. That's I'm why just asking we're for to a the, system in that's place. That's the system. So, Okay, so you just came up with that because we've no, never, we've that's never operated system. like that. I've been on this council if since you, 2008. If the chair, we've never operated like if that. If the chair was not familiar. We've never operated like that, uh, count, uh, we uh, need President to, we uh, could, McBride. If we continue we've never to have conversation like with this is how it's going to go. Now I would well, then at that this time, to be a policy of the council that's adopted. And we are working on that as well with the ch Chapter 2, which you know that we're working on Chapter 2 updates. That's one of the ones that we will be more uniform with what we are doing and how bills are presented, as well as we talked about emulating uh, or looking at the county's uh, system as well and not having first, second, third reading on the same night. So that's still a work in process that the Rules Committee is upgrading with the city and county attorney as well. So we are moving forward with what we've talked about. I remember at least two years ago at the retreat about cleaning up chapter two and that's one of the processes. Yeah, I got that, and I'm fine with so that. So thank, thank you. you. Is I'm there just any other new business? There needs to be a system to put in place. We, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it needs Is to there be on any paper other? Too. I'm uh, sorry. It needs to be on paper too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Is there any other new business? Yeah, there's new business. That's old business. I do have new business. I want to invite everybody out to um, for six o'clock tomorrow is a meeting at um, the LaSalle Park Neighborhood Association. It's hosting. Um, at about Washington High School and even more so the West Side. And it starts at 6 p.m. It's at the Charles Black Recreational Center. And it's uh, in response to 
the removal of a pr uh, principal at Washington High School, but there are other issues that are connected. So all of you are invited, come as you are, or, or you know, if you don't, if you can't, you know, sure, it's fine as well. So just wanted to update that. Also, uh, and I'm gonna be as quick as I can with this one. Um, I received really bad e voicemails from someone. We can't track it back. I was sent to IT. Um, everybody was uh, empathetic with the gentleman and the way that he um, behaves and calling me. I don't know if anyone else gets those phone calls, but I get them. Yeah, I can be helpful. Yeah, and so I there. So where I'm going with this is not necessarily with him because it's just a phone call, right? It's words, but you know something to look at because people can get a bit crazy. Um, you have an issue right now, um, same conversation about Bex Lake and the fact that you have people that still live over in that area. I grew up in that area. Sharon, you grew up over there. Karen, you're from over in that area as well. Uh, and there's so many other people that have worked for the city, that work for the city that's from over there. And as we are continuing the discussion about contamination, I find it really odd that we're talking about contamination in the present tense. Um, we were victims. We grew up out there. We drank that water. Uh, we played in those playgrounds, et cetera. So we were victimized when we were growing up. No one is saying that the lead levels are dangerous now. It's clear. But you're still staying on top of a dump. That hill is a collection of all the outhouses that people lived in and it's still trash. That's still trash. All, we can beautify it, we can say that it's fun sledding down it, but it's still trash. My point is that if we are not sensitive enough to what is happening with those people, and then we hear from our mayor saying that it's, we can put, build more basketball courts, then my next question is when can we start planting more watermelon? Because that's how I feel. I feel that the, the statement itself in itself and, and the way that it was presented was racist. I believe that, that was, that's called um, environmental racism. It's a real thing. When people are allowed to, in, in, to live in an environment that impacts their health the way that that has. There's all kinds of people that have died of cancer. I used to be a paper boy over there. I know, know those people. So I'm trying to imp impress upon your um, morals, um, your heart, that this situation, yes, it's fine now. But we grew up out there. I grew up on Sheridan. You were off of uh, uh, Washington. Uh, I think that you talk about Kenmore Street a lot. This, this is our home. We were impacted, victimized. There needs to be more discussion, and it needs to be more of a plan, because the trash is still sitting out there. We're still impacted. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to um, clarify that we had scheduled a residential neighborhood um, committee for April 14th. We had to reschedule that because there are other meetings and individuals who will be part of the presentation. Uh, they have uh, scheduling conflicts. I thought that we could move it to April the 18th. I, was, I failed to realize that that is a very busy day and evening, so I'm looking at April the 19th, I will email committee members to see if they are available and also if the chamber is available. I'll send out an email either late tonight or early tomorrow morning. Councilor Tomas Walton. Yeah, President McBride, I just want to um, uh, remind people of um, meetings uh, where we're gathering public input on the next home repair program I attended. Um, the one at Howard Park on April 7th, and um, it's a really great process in place to receive this public feedback. Um, so there are two remaining um, tomorrow at the Charles Black Community Center at 5.30 and Thursday on April 14th um, at 5.30. And um, residents can also fill out a, a survey at together um, dot southbendin.gov but really um, ask for council people's help in pushing out that survey thank you Councilor Lee uh, President McBride I just want to just remind people to be very mindful and prayerful for 
the victims of the, sh the shootings that have happened in the last week. Uh, we've, had, we've had several that were under the age of 17. Thank God that they have not been life-threatening, but it is life-altering, and so we really, uh, really need to, to look at what's going on and how our kids get guns in our community and um, making sure that as we get ready to go into the warmer months that people are conscious of, of where their children are at and who their children are hanging with and, uh, and working on ways to engage so that we don't have a, a violent summer. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, ask for all of you to, for your thoughts and prayers for these victims and families and as, as we are trying to deal with the aftermath of, of uh, the young people having guns and what's happened. Thank you, Councilor Hammond. Thank you, President McBride. Um, as an extension of the Child Abuse Prevention Resolution, I just want to remind everyone that there is the birth equity workshop that is taking place at the Century Center on Wednesday, April 13th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And I also like to invite people, if you're not doing anything on Wednesday at 5 o'clock at the Center Branch Library, I will be speaking about the book and the movie Just Mercy, talking about uh, injustices and uh, equality for people on uh, getting out of prison and needing assistance and uh, help for second chances. Thank you. At this time, we will move to the privilege of the floor. Disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech or actions, as well as verbal attacks on any person, may result in an indiv individual without notice forfeiting the remainder of his or her allotted time. Individuals who wish to address the council must state their name and residential address. Individuals will be limited to three minutes only. The maximum time limit for this portion of the meeting shall be 30 minutes. Individuals shall not be permitted to address topics in which the council has heard previously tonight on the agenda. The council president may assign a topic raised by an individual during the privileges of the floor to the appropriate council member and to request the city clerk to contact a member of the city administration for a review and topics assigned shall be responded to by the next scheduled council meeting. Is there anybody wishing to speak for the purpose of the floor at this time? There, we do have someone virtually, uh, Ellen Stecker. Uh, Ms. Stecker, if you could unmute uh, yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. Uh, thank you very much for allowing this time. Uh, my name is Ellen Stecker. I live at 1036 North Niles Avenue in South Bend. And I'm here to ask you all for your help with the enforcement of several city ordinances specifically those involving noise, obstructing signs, and traffic obstruction of a, of a business. Violations of these ordinances are occurring on a regular basis at the Whole Woman's Health Center at 3511 Lincoln Way West by a group that calls itself Abolish Human Abortion. The Whole Woman's Clinic provides very early abortion and I support their presence in our community as do many others. Their staff has worked cooperatively with the South Bend Police Department over the years that they've been in business to establish safety protocols and to put up appropriate no trespassing signs. However, in the past two years, when staff have called the police for violations, the police might come, but no tickets or consequences for the violations have occurred. Subsequently, the violations continue. The Whole Woman's Health Advocacy Director, along with the Director of the Civil Rights Heritage Center, uh, met with the South Bend Police, but enforcement has not changed. The District 1 attempts to um, meet with District 1 council member have been unsuccessful. Um, myself and another uh, clinic supporter did manage to meet with Henry Davis, who suggested we speak with you all. Um, I, along with the majority in our city, county, and state support access to abortion. I do understand that not all do. That's not the issue here. There are regular protesters to the west of the clinic with permission by the local right to life owned um, owners to, to be there to pray, meditate, and to offer flyers to patients. We're not talking about them. We're talking about those who scream cruel, very unchristian messages at patients and staff who obstruct entry and exit from the clinic 
and whose signs block the line of vision for traffic on Lincoln Way West. They create clear safety traffic ha hazards, including for the children that they often bring with them. Their excessive noise impairs the delivery of medical services. They cause chaos and anger for many, increasing the risk of violence. The Common Council passed many ordinances to maintain public safety and to permit legal businesses, including medical facilities, to operate. The Whole Woman's Health Center is a legal taxpaying business in this community um, and has many grateful clients. I and others feel that these violations need to cease, and we ask your help in enforcing the ordinances that you have passed. I will email you details. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else, Clerk Jones? That exhausts the virtual list. I, I'm not sure if there is anyone present publicly that would like to speak. If you can come up to the podium, please, and state your name and address. sure if I'm in line, out of line, but I'm a little bit upset. Um, my name is Marilyn Vishal, and I live at 2514 Kenwood, South Bend, Indiana, 46628. Uh, about a week ago, I called Councilman Davis. I actually have a phone full of pictures to support. In my neighborhood, um, the 1,000 homes in 1,000 days was impacted by that program. So we have a lot of vacant lots. We previously had vacant lots, but in the meantime, there's a lot of overgrown trees. There's a lot of large branches. Neighbors do not have the equipment to actually handle the branches, so I called the forestry department, and they said it was not something they could take care of because of the location of the trees, and so I called Henry. And I was asking for some kind of support we're always talking about beautification. We're talking about making <laughs> Martin Luther King Center the heart of my neighborhood, actually putting $11 million into that particular corner and all the arteries leading up to Martin Luther King um, are scary. I don't even know how people would wanna go to such a building if they drive through those particular neighborhoods. So I'm asking the council to at some point support whatever you have to do to help Henry get what he's trying to do so that you guys can review what's going on in my neighborhood. I pay taxes, I have neighbors that pay taxes, I'm a homeowner. We live in a neighborhood that we've lived in for over 60 plus years and my father actually built the house. So we're not moving, we've actually put money into our property um, and I'm sure we'll be there until my mother who's 92 if she decides at some point to go into a nursing home or something like that, otherwise we'll be there. So I would like support so that you guys can take up this issue and help us beautify our neighborhood. That's what I'm asking, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And with that, I will call this meeting adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>